I love multifamily. I like, I mean, you know, we buy self storage units, we buy uh, and build student housing uh, projects as big as 130 million, projects as small as 7 million. When you're looking at an aging debt, and the loan to value drops from 75 pre COVID to 65 post or during COVID, returns, I mean, are not the same. By definition, they cannot be the same. Two and a half, three percent. They're making five to eight percent. And the delta is just pure profit on money that they didn't even, it wasn't even theirs to begin That's with. That's right. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well. I hope that everything is great today. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Ready to Scale. I'm Ellie Perlman, your host broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. Today, I have a very special guest. I'm speaking with Jennifer Risher. So Jennifer is the author of a really interesting book called We Need to Talk, a memoir about wealth. And we're going to talk to her about the book, why she wrote it, and why do we need to talk about wealth and how can we talk about wealth? Um, a little bit about Jennifer. She's a former early years employee of Microsoft, which is, uh, you know, kind of the dream of a lot of my uh, friends and colleagues to um, join an early startup that is basically going to be very successful. So she joined Microsoft shortly after their IPO and she acquired wealth through a uh, good fortune of starting with uh, the, this company early in her career. Now she's retired. The interesting also thing about Jennifer is that she founded a nonprofit called Half My DAF, and DAFs are donor advised funds, which we're going to talk about and learn about. And Jennifer basically started this uh, nonprofit because there are over $140 billion that are parked in donor advised funds, those DAFs. And our foundation helps getting those donations to be deployed to nonprofit organizations. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Jennifer to the show. Hey, Jennifer. Hi, Ellie. Thanks. Fun to be here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really excited to have you here today. And uh, we were kind of chatting a little bit before we started recording. We have you know, a little bit, actually a lot in common, um, but um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your journey and how you know you found yourself joining Microsoft and what happened since since you've joined them. Yes, thank you. Yeah, let's go back 25 years. <laughs> We're actually 30 years. I was 25 and I took this job at a software company. I didn't know much about it, Microsoft. And I got really lucky. I met my husband, David, and I got stock options that ended up being worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and no one really knew what stock options were at the time. So it was just felt like all this money on paper that was floating around in the future. And then boom, it, it turned into real, real money. Um, and six, six years after David and I met, um, when we were married and I was pregnant with our first child, David um, took a job at a small unknown startup that was selling books on the internet called Amazon. And we were in our early 30s, the company went public, and suddenly we had more money than we could really wrap our heads around. And of course, I want to say up front that money makes life easier. Um, we're very fortunate. But wealth surprised me. You know, having a lot of money doesn't look or feel like what Hollywood sells us. It can be isolating. And I felt the impact as a parent, and as a sister, as a friend and as a daughter, it felt painful that my parents sort of disapproved of what we had. You know, eight out of 10 people with wealth grew up middle class or poor, and we're not talking to each other about the emotional challenges. And of course, it might be hard to imagine wealth as a challenge <clears throat> that needs to be overcome, but it you know, especially now when there's so much need, um, COVID has shown a spotlight on racial and economic inequality. And I, I mean, I feel like I should pay more taxes. Minimum wage needs to be higher. We need a stronger social safety net. There's so many policy changes that are needed. But my goal is really to change something at a very personal level. I want to get us talking about money. I want to move money out of the taboo category 
and out of the shame category and really help us start to have conversations. Because normally, I mean, in my life, if I have a problem or a question, I want to figure out, should our 16-year-old have a curfew? I talk to everyone I know. (laughs) It's how I do my research. I talk to my friends and I hear their advice. I hear about their experiences. I get different perspectives. And just the act of talking is helpful because it lets me know my problem is normal and that it's valid and that it's shared. But the same isn't happening with money. And, you know, back 25 years ago, I, I couldn't, I didn't feel like I could talk to my friends about having a lot of it. And so I thought, well, I'll turn to books, but there really are no books. <laughs> and I, I ended up writing the book I needed and wanted to read. So I'm sharing my story as a way to help other people understand their own. And my goal is not to be prescriptive. I can't tell you how to do rich, right? I don't have the answer for that, but I'm offering up a story that really hasn't been told that explores things like, you know, how challenging it can be to travel with another family that doesn't share your resources or how upsetting it can be to feel a friend's jealousy and not be able to share what's really going on in your life. You know, I'm sharing these stories to help other people understand their own. I'm also sharing these stories to get us talking so that we start sharing our stories with each other. Because no matter how much you have in the bank account, you're probably not talking about money. And we don't talk about it because of because we're afraid. I mean, it's so emotional. And the fear that comes up around hurting someone's feelings or being rejected or not measuring up or sounding unknowledgeable. I mean, we all have these sort of shameful feelings around money because it's something we don't talk about. It's sort of, you know, hidden. And I'm hoping to help help us start having those conversations. Yeah, I, I really think that, you know, bef- obviously before you make money, you think, oh, from once I'm going to have money, it's going to be great. Nobody's really thinking about how it changes relationships and how it changes the way we communicate. And an interesting question that I have that has been bugging me for a while, why is there such a negative connotation? Why, why is it awkward to talk about money? And sometimes even between two successful and wealthy family members or friends, sometimes money is taboo and you don't, you just don't talk about it. And maybe, and and I'm, I'm trying to, to realize why, I mean, it's, if you've earned it by working hard, you're paying your taxes, there's nothing wrong about having money, but why is it so hard for us to talk about money with other people? It really is hard. I mean, I think, um, well, I think, you know, when you do have wealth, there is that stigma and no one wants to feel other people's jealousy or resentment. You don't want to bring up, you know, envy. You want to connect. I mean, that I think is what, you know, drives us all. That's, we want to connect with other people. We want to be in relationship. And when you feel as though there's this inequality or sense of uh, shame or, or, or guilt or, or, you know, someone else is going to judge you. It makes it hard to, to, to bring up the conversation. And plus, you know, we are not socialized, especially as women to talk about money. And yeah. so the, the idea of, of bringing it up, I mean, when I was growing up, it was impolite. I remember asking what my dad's salary was and that was none of my business. And it was very impolite mm-hmm. to bring it up. Um, but I think we need to shatter that. I think we need to start talking to each other, especially as women. I mean, we need to share numbers. We need to talk about how much we're making, how much we're charging by the hour, if we want to gain equality. And I think the more we do talk about the numbers and, and, and kind of what our feelings around money, the more we can kind of take it out of the dark and, and put it in the light and treat it for what it is, not as something that's bigger than us or, or something yeah. scary or something that's going to divide us, but something that can really, once we look at it closely, can be used as a tool and that we can kind of talk about together. And I've had so many of those experiences just in my own 
life around, you know, once you can, I mean, when you don't talk about something, it kind of looms large and takes on a life of its own. But once you look at it and you can connect with another person, it changes the dynamic. So I, I'll, let me share a couple of stories. One is with a, a friend of mine who's, who is middle class. And she told me how she and her husband drove the same car for many, many years. And she said, you know, when that thing finally broke down, I bought an Audi Q5. She'd always wanted that car. She was very excited about the car, but then she thought about driving over to her sister's and she started to worry about being judged. And in her mind, you know, she, she saw herself driving up and her sister looking at her and saying, oh, aren't we fancy? And then in her mind, she started to justify the car and mm -hmm. say, well, it was used. It wasn't that expensive. So even before she saw her sister, she began telling herself stories and making assumptions. What if she actually talked to her sister and found out what her sister really thought, what she was really feeling? And I've had this experience myself with, with my brother. So I have a, a brother who's two years younger and um, he went into the Peace Corps after college and then he got a master's in Spanish and he became a high school Spanish teacher. And this was many years ago, he, was, he wanted to buy a house. And my husband and I offered him $20,000 towards his down payment, but he refused our gift. He said he wanted to live within his own means. And at this time that hurt my feelings. I thought he was looking down at our money and, and I felt like he was rejecting me, but I didn't say anything. I just kept quiet. And a few years later when he was getting married, we again sent a check and this was a wedding gift and he accepted. And when his first child was born, again, we sent money and he and his wife thanked us. And we began to send them money every year and over the course of many, many years, he stopped acknowledging the gift. So mm -hmm. I'd write a check in December and hear silence. And it was like that money was just disappearing into a void. And I began to feel resentful and I felt taken for granted, but I didn't say anything. Instead, I told myself stories. I thought, well, he's embarrassed or that, well, actually, you know, he probably thinks we have so much money. It just means nothing to us. So I didn't say anything and I'm not proud to admit this, but just a few years ago, I just didn't send a check. And um, later when we were corresponding over email, he, at the bottom of his note, he said, wondering if a certain year end check is just late in the mail, is it? And I read that mm -hmm. and I was mad and I, of course, knew we had to talk. And it wasn't, here I was writing a book about money and talking about money, but it was still really difficult, very uncomfortable. And I really had to sit down and think about what I hoped to achieve, what I wanted to say. And when I got on the phone, I said, you know, my feelings are hurt that you haven't really acknowledged or thanked us for the gifts we've been giving you. And he apologized right away. He said he hadn't realized he was very sorry. And he said, you know, I thought it was easier for you if I didn't make a big deal of the money, which made sense given how we grew up. And then we began to talk to each other. And as we connected as two people who love and trust each other, then we put money in its place, not as something bigger than us, but as a tool. And then when we were connected and talking as a brother and a sister, he said, you know, I don't need that money, but I really appreciate it. And, you know, I'd never asked. And I said, I don't care what you're doing with it, but I'm curious, you know, what are you doing with it? I want to know. I want to be part of your life. That's a, a really interesting story. And I think it was interesting how you took something that came out of good intention, goodwill, and was not maybe between the two of you, but kind of something bigger that was the elephant in the room. And then just naming it sometimes takes the power out, out of it because money should have power, but not in a negative sense. So when it starts to, like you've mentioned, you know, you have that story that you tell in your head and then what's really going to happen. And it's, um, 
it's it's interesting because you're giving your money more power than it should have because of the narrative that you have in your head. Um, I think it's really interesting, you know, your your uh, friend's story about the car. I I remember that at some point I wanted to buy a car. I'm, um, I, I love driving and I'm taking driving, you know, lessons and I like to take it to the, uh, to the track. Um, and, um, when I wanted to buy a certain car, I was actually worried about not even, of course, what my friends are going to say, but what are strangers going to say or think? And I remember Googling if, you know, how are people being treated driving in a certain car? And I read, um, there were reviews of people who owned those cars and said, you know, people are interested in coming to talk to them about the car or that they're, they're actually giving them the finger or whatever it was. And it took me a while to come to peace with it and say, you know what, you know what, you like it, you worked hard for it. You shouldn't care about what strangers think. And with, you know, family members, it was a little bit of a harder Pro, you know, it, it was a little bit harder for me to say, okay, this is my car and and not and, and feel okay with what I thought would be a judgment. And for some of them, it was a non-issue at all. And it was like what happened with you and your brother was a story well, I was telling myself and it was really nothing there. Congratulations on buying the car you want and having the courage to do that and, and realizing that, you know, you've it's for you and what you care about. I grew up, I dreamed of having a Porsche. I love driving too. I wanted a Porsche. And I realized, you know, that in the end, that wasn't me and it wasn't kind of what I wanted. But I, I also have gone through that whole scenario in my head around, you know, what other people might think and, and what family members would think and how would I feel and is that me? And it's, it's kind of crazy. And that's how I think we do think about money. I mean, there's so much judgment, so much stigma, both on both sides. So you can be put on a pedestal, glamorized, glorified. You could also be villainized and yeah. torn down yeah. and hated. And I think it's interesting to think how much shame can come with wealth. There's also at the other end of the spectrum, there's a lot of shame around poverty and being not sure. having enough. And that shame is very, very real too. So it's, I think it speaks to how skewed our view of money is in this country and how we need to heal from that. And I think the way to start is to bring it into the light and yeah. have a conversation like that. I mean, you're right. I, it's interesting to hear all the thoughts you had about buying your car that were so much in your head and not actual conversations, which, yeah. which help kind of diffuse all that anxiety that comes up. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's absolutely shame also around poverty. Um, you know, I remember when I was still living in Tel Aviv, I was dating with who's my husband today was my boyfriend at the time. And he really liked to go out and eat out. And we were always splitting the, the bill. But I wasn't, you know, he wanted to go out almost every night. I think we had one night that we were sitting at home and making dinner. And I couldn't pay for this lifestyle. And he took me, I think, four, three or four months to gather courage and sit down with him and say, listen, I cannot pay for it. I have debt and I actually can't go out every night. And if you want, you have to pay for it or I'm happy to, you know, eat at home. And I remember his response. He kind of looked at me and I said, oh my God, is he going to judge me for not having money? And he said, why did it take you so long to tell me? I'm, I mean, I'm happy to, to pay for it and we can alternate and eat at home, but you're, you're right. It's, it's again, it's that shame around money, whether you have a lot of it or you don't, it's some, it, there's always a narrative in our heads about how others are going to handle or think about the situation. Yeah. And that narrative, I think we've got to get out of our heads and have the conversation. And I think it's great you had that conversation with your, at the time, boyfriend. And I encourage people to have those conversations. And it starts with figuring out what you feel, like what's coming up for me, you know, what, what, what am I feeling, knowing that, and then finding time to really have that conversation with someone else. And at the start of that conversation, acknowledging that it's uncomfortable, that we don't normally talk about money, we're going to go into this Space where, you know, we're going to be fumbling around. Let's give each other permission to 
get it wrong, get messy. Let's have this conversation that kind of creates a safe space for people. And then, like you said, like you, you admit, you know, I don't feel like I can go out. Maybe you're feeling a little ashamed. You should be able to afford these things. You, 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 you've realized you feel ashamed and the, the other person might say, wow, I had no idea. Might, likely they had no idea. Let me, let me buy. It doesn't matter. Or they say, oh, I had no idea. Let's just eat at home. <laughs> or they say, thank you for saying that because I can't afford this either. I'm also in a lot of debt. <laughs> like you don't yeah. know what, what someone else might be feeling and thinking That's and going right. through themselves until you broach the, the topic. And I yeah. think we are a lot more alike than different. So we're likely to find out that, you know, our feelings and our thoughts are, are more similar than we think. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I want to shift gears a bit and talk about half my DAF. Um, if you can just talk a little bit about what what's a DAF, how it works and why and how you were inspired to start this organization. Yes. Well, it's actually, it didn't start as an organization, but let me start with the donor advised fund. So donor advised funds are charitable vehicles um, where you can put money in, you get your tax break up front, and then you have time to organize your giving. So this happens, maybe you've had a, some sort of taxable event in your year or your financial advisor says, this is a good time to, to get a tax break. Let's move some money into a, a donor advised fund. Um, and once it goes into those that a donor advised funds is irrevocable. You cannot get it back. It is. It needs to go to a nonprofit or to impact investment. Um, um, but it it allows you to kind of give over time. So it it it's sort of like having a charitable checking account. So you put your money in, mm. and then you have time. The problem is that you have all the time in the world. There's no payout requirement. There's no amount that you need to, to pay out. So what's happening is a lot of people are putting money into a donor advised fund, but they're not moving it through. And there's no mechanism. There's no person who's going to nudge you or say, okay, now's the moment. Take, you know, spend some out. Now's the time to give. And when COVID hit, um, in this time last year, my husband and I were just thinking, wow, what are we going to do for nonprofits? My husband runs a nonprofit himself and he was feeling the funding was kind of drying up. The stock market was crashing. Don't, our nonprofits couldn't you know, have their luncheons. They couldn't fundraise the same way. And yet the need was greater than ever. They were working harder than ever. And so we were just like, what can we do for nonprofits? I, I, we had kind of doubled down on places we already gave, but we wanted to do more. And we wanted to give and we wanted to inspire others. So we were also aware of this hundred and at the time, 20 billion. Now it's 140 billion. I think it's a lot more than that uh, money stuck in donor advised funds. So we put up a million dollars saying we will match grants made from donor advised funds. We wanted to inspire giving. We wanted to get giving moving from donor advised funds to nonprofits. So our half my DAF challenge is commit to spending down half of the money that's in your donor advised fund by September 30th, this was last year, and start giving. We didn't put any limits on this. We didn't want to, we won't support anything that that's, um, supports hate crime or, or gun violence. But other than that, give where you want. Our goal was to inspire and give. Um, so people started giving and we let, kept a list of all the nonprofits people gave to. We matched grants in July and we matched grants again at the end of September. And people gave to 750 different nonprofits. They made 900 grants and we were wow. able to match 350 of those grants with our million dollars. And our million dollars turned into 8.6 million out of DAFs to nonprofits in just five months. Wow, that's incredible. It was amazing. It was very exciting. And I have to say, you know, when my husband and I came up with the idea, there was a moment of like nervousness because suddenly we'd be out there saying we have a million dollars to give away. This is part of the problem of, of, you know, the fears that come with kind of saying that. I, and at the same time, I'm glad I pushed through that nervousness and, and there's been no negative backlash. It's been very positive. We got a lot of good press. We've got a lot of 
donor is telling us, thank you. This is the nudge I needed. We're sitting around the dinner table talking about where we want to give. I've, I've asked my, I've told my parents about this. I've gotten them to half their DAF. We've had incredible response from the nonprofit community who it's such a win-win. This gives them the opportunity to reach out to a donor, the eligibility for a match. I mean, it's really kind of created this whole movement. And, you know, our intention had been to like get people to give now, but we had so much positive energy that we're doing it again this year. So we again put up a million dollars and we had people join us on the matching pool side last year. They're giving more this year. And, you know, as parents, we had the most amazing Christmas gift because our daughters came to us and said, we want to be part of half my DAF. We want to give money towards half my DAF. And they said, we, my older daughter wanted to give towards racial justice issues. Our younger daughter wanted to give to climate change. So now we have pools of money for racial justice and climate change and education in underserved communities, and then for reproductive health. So again, we're doing a, a general match um, and we're going to be matching May 15th and again on September 30th. We would love to have people who have donor advised funds join us, start giving. It, your giving will be leveraged through um, matches from us. And um, it's, it's just exciting to see the spark that this has kind of created around giving and, and, and the awareness it's created around how much money is stuck in donor advised funds. That's, that's amazing. I'm sure that a lot of the listeners, a lot of our listeners have money um, in, in those vehicles, in DAFs and uh, donor advised funds. And um, it's definitely, if you have the money there, we're going to add to the show notes, um, a link to where, you know, how they can reach out to you and start the process. Right now, a lot of our investors are doing really well. And we're doing well, but there's a lot of pain out there. There's a lot of need. And we have, in my opinion, that social responsibility to reach out. And especially if the money was already out of our hands, it's just sitting there doing nothing. And so, you know, definitely need to push that money out of those accounts and put it in good use, especially now. And there's just so, so much pain out there. So well, I really, really appreciate your efforts and we're going to, I'm also going to have to have a lot of questions for you, you know, offline on specifically, you know, to our case. Um, but when it comes to moving money and actually deploying the money, is there anything that investors or individuals should know before they start the process? You know, I am a big believer in trust-based, values-based giving. I think there are so many people who are dedicating their lives to a cause. And so anyone working in a nonprofit is focused nonstop on the on that cause, whether it's animal rights or reproductive health or racial justice issues or climate or education. I mean, a nonprofit in that in, in is after a specific cause trying to help. I think we have to trust those nonprofits. I, I, I think there's of course some due diligence. You need to find out what their budget is and how, you know, who they're serving. But my framework is all about getting to know the, the ED, the executive director of a nonprofit, having a conversation and starting a relationship because I look at a nonprofit as doing the work that needs to get done and how thankful I am that that's happening and how lucky I am to have the resources to add to it. So I see it as a partnership. Um, places that I give to, I, I really feel I'm in partnership with them. And I think the more you can get involved, the more long-term fulfillment and um, impact you can have. I mean, I've been involved. I, one of the organizations I give to is Girls on the Run, and I was a coach for the Girls on the Run. And I learned so much about the, the program and the girls. It just really opened my heart to this, this mission of empowering girls. Um, and yeah, and I will never stop giving to them. They are, they're doing amazing work. Um, I give to an organization that, that serves kids on the, on the border um, through a, a tennis program, an education program. And again, I, I just feel the more you get to know an organization and understand their struggles and their you know, successes, um, 
the more impact you can have because you then you have a voice in the in the cause and you have um it, it just I think that relationship is really just so important to build the relationship with the people who are doing the work. Yeah, absolutely. Jennifer, thank you so much for having such an inspiring and fun conversation. This is um, a topic that I'm, you know, personally passionate about. My husband and I are very passionate about, and um, it was really great to hear this fresh perspective. So I really, really appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Ellie. It's, a, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for talking with me. Yeah, absolutely. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. Um, we're actually, uh, we've arrived to the last por portion of the podcast, which is the lightning round questions. So we have four quick questions for you. The first one is, and I think I know the answer to that, but maybe you can surprise me. Um, what's your favorite hobby? Oh, yeah, I'm a tennis player. I love to play tennis. I love watching and playing tennis. So as often as I can, I'm out on the courts, um, enjoying a good tennis game. Um, yeah, just love it. Awesome. Um, and what's the one thing that people don't really know about you? Well, it's a strange thing that has come to mind. Um, when I was a little girl, I loved to collect things. I had many, many collections. Mm. I collected stamps and spoons and charms. And one of my favorite collections was hedgehogs. And I collected hedgehogs from all over the world and, you know, soft and furry as well as ceramic. And so <laughs> I just thought the hedgehog was the cutest thing. And yeah, I was a big hedgehog collector. <laughs> That's interesting. That's very random. That. <laughs> <laughs> well, now they do. Um, what do you wish you had known when you first started donating money to charities? I wish I had started earlier. I think we need to start. I think it's so easy to get to that. And when we, a long time ago, we put money into a donor advised fund. And I realized at that point, wow, letting go of the money isn't the hardest part. It's figuring out where to give. And suddenly I was feeling as though I needed a philanthropic strategy. I needed to do all the research. I need to make sure every single dollar was accounted for. I needed to do giving right. And I need to do it perfectly. And the fear of getting it wrong kept me super stuck, which I should, I wish I had just unstuck myself and started mm -hmm. to give because it's, it's a, it too, just like talking about money, it's a muscle we need to build. And until we start, we're not going to have the experience. We're not going to understand what it's really like. So I'd encourage my, my previous self to start earlier and to give and start giving and have that experience and get involved and have a conversation with the organizations that you um, want to support. Talk to the people there you'll learn so much by, by talking to the people who are on the, on the ground. And it, and as I've been talking about this, I want to give a shout out to my husband's nonprofit. He co-founded um, 10 years ago called world reader. And he's been getting digital books into the hands of kids in the developing world for the last 10 years in Kenya and Ghana. He's working with Syrian refugees in Jordan. He's in India. And now with the education crisis here in the United States, He's partnering with, with people here and coming to the United States. He's in Appalachia. He's in the Bronx. He's, he's coming to um, Fife outside of, of Seattle and in Oakland. So he's really focused on helping kids read. And um, he's doing some amazing work. He has over 15 million kids reading in his program. Wow. So I wanted to mention World Reader while I had a chance. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, do you have any website or any tool that you can recommend for someone who wants to start moving their money out of ETF or even donating directly, just a tool that can maybe kind of have all the information on nonprofits, you know, aggregated there or some, some way to vet some of those uh, charitable foundations. Yeah, it, there's so many different organizations. It can feel yeah. really overwhelming. I think the best place to start is looking inside your heart, figuring out what you care about unless you know what you care about, you're not going to be as engaged. If you have to find that passion, figure it out. I mean, maybe whatever it is, there's no right or wrong. I think that's the other thing. You, you're not going to get this wrong. And if you give, you're not going to, your money's not going to be wasted. We, we, 
you know, it's, we easily buy a car, we easily buy a house, but we have some sort of stuckness around Mm -hmm. giving. And I think I want to unstick that. So look inside yourself, figure out what you care about. Talk to a couple friends. Do you know any organizations that are doing this work? Um, come to half my DAF. You'll see a list of nonprofits of places people are giving. It might spark some ideas. Um, but but talk to a couple people. Google something. You know, if you care about racial justice and you want to help someone locally, Google Providence and you know racial justice organizations in Providence. See who they are. Give them a call. I mean, it really you don't get overwhelmed by all the different organizations. Just think about what you can do and start building those relationships. Give a thousand dollars, give five thousand dollars. It 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 doesn't have to be all at once, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, but start the process. All right, that's awesome advice. So Jennifer, where can people find information about Half My Daff and also where can people find your book? Thank you for Memoir that. About, well, well, yeah. Um, Half My Daff is at www.halfmydaff.com. Um, and um, you can find information about my book at my website, which is Jennifer Risher, um, two R's there, dot com. And you can buy the book at your local independent bookstore. You can buy it at Amazon. Um, We need to talk a memoir about wealth. All right. Jennifer, thank you again. Thank you so much for being here on the show. That was a very, very inspiring conversation. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Ellie. It was fun. Thanks a lot. All right. And to you, the listeners, I hope that um, it was inspiring for you as well. Be bold, be great, keep moving forward, and I'll see you on the next episode.